these two guys have Minnesota sports flowing in their veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. Bonus scoop time, which means that we are joined now by Darren Doogie Wolfson, Channel 5 Eyewitness News, also Scoop Podcast fame, the guy who brings us all of the insights and scoopage from uh, the local sports scene, Judd, Declan, and uh, Darren. And uh, Dukes, let's start with this, the red hot team in, in town. I saw I saw your tweet, by the way, and, and it's not surprising, but it remains remarkable. On a Sunday when the Vikings are good, the ratings and the share and all of that good stuff. Um, I mean, you talk about television executives salivating. The numbers you tweeted from that Bills game, while not surprising, are phenomenal. They are. Good afternoon, Judd. Hello, Declan. Judd, I can tell you there are executives in our building <laughs> very, 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 very much praying that ABC picks up one of those final two Vikings games. I know there's a possibility. I can't remember if it's the Green Bay game. It might be the Chicago game, that last mm-hmm. game of the year. But there is a tiny chance that ABC could pick that game up. I can promise you Hubbard executives are salivating, as oh. you just said. Here are the ratings, the local TV ratings oh. from Sunday. This is the Twin Cities viewing area, which extends a pretty good – amount you know in terms of distance west north south pretty much to saint peter maybe a little below saint peter but pretty much saint peter but also east i mean you can go 45 minutes on 94 east into wisconsin you still get the twin cities stations maybe it's 40 minutes 35 minutes but point is i'm not just talking about minneapolis saint paul the immediate suburbs. So the Twin Cities viewing area is a much larger area. That being said, the total amount of viewers for Vikings Bills, over 1 million. The share was 80, which means 80% of the TVs in use were watching the Vikings Bills game. Judd, I did not tweet out the demo breakdowns, but I can tell you in demos, the numbers were even more absurd. I just thought total viewers, it's an easy number for right. a lot of people just to relate to. But if you really want to break it down, men, 25 to 54, some of the other demos, 18 to 34, Judd, the numbers are through the roof. Now, more often than not, road games will generate a better TV number than home games, right? Because at U.S. Bank Stadium, you have 65,000 people in attendance. That's a couple ratings points. But yeah, like the Monday night game, week two, the Philadelphia game, that was over 1 million total viewers. So the interest in the Vikings, even going back to after the Green Bay win, week one, the interest just continues to be incredibly strong. Interesting stuff. Yeah. Um, So let's talk about this team uh, coming off a remarkable comeback win from 17 points down at one point in the third quarter against the Buffalo Bills. Let's get to the scoop part of things first. What can you tell us about the injuries? Because Darisaw left with a concussion. Um, uh, Evans left, uh, who was starting in place, obviously, of Dantzler, who's on IR, with a concussion. Uh, So there's certainly some concern there. Dalvin Tomlinson missed a second consecutive game, and the Vikings won again. What can you tell us going into Sunday's 3, I think 25, start against Dallas about the injury updates for the Vikings. Let's start with Derisaw, uh, because while Blake Brandell did play well, Christian Derisaw right now, in my opinion, is tracking to be a first-team All-Pro, which is beyond impressive. Yeah, I mean, Blake played 39 snaps. He had the one penalty, but considering the difficult circumstances he was facing, all things considered, job well done. Yep. As of last night, Judd, as of Monday night, Christian Darisol was still in the concussion protocol. Now, he has been active on social media. So it's not like he's locked in a dark room, not able to be on his phone. So we'll get a better sense tomorrow, Wednesday. But that is at least somewhat encouraging. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned, I think it was just a slip of the tongue, Cam Dantzler. That's an ankle. And he was placed on injured reserve on Saturday There's some pessimism there. 
Like mm-hmm. IR, okay. So maybe, you know, some people are saying, okay, he but there's some pessimism there that this is more than a four-week injury. On a Caleb Evans, still in the concussion protocol, but like Dara saw, he too was active on Monday night on social media. I did check with somebody close to Evans. They said he was feeling better, but that's subjective, right? right. I mean, there's a million ways we could dissect that. Point is, as of Monday night, he too was still in the concussion protocol. Who else do we need to go up and down the list of? Duke Shelley came in, made that great play, second to last play of the game on Sunday. You know, Dawson Knox, six foot four, Duke Shelley, five eight, five nine, turned his head. Duke Shelley was in for three snaps, but that was an excellent play by Duke Shelley. So people were asking, was Andrew Booth Jr. hurt? Why was Andrew Booth Jr. not in the game? My understanding, Judd, is he's fine. Now, he got picked on. I don't know if he's fine mentally, but physically, he is okay. Now, I can't sit here and tell you, like, 100% definitively, Shelly was in for Booth because of performance. But I can just tell you, Andrew Booth Jr. left that game on Sunday feeling okay. There is no injury concern there. Zadarius Smith banged up his knee, as far as I know, Judd. There is no concern with Zadarius. Maybe he'll be limited on Wednesday, but no concern heading into the Sunday. You're right, 325 game at U.S. Bank Stadium against Dallas. There is relative optimism on Dalvin Tomlinson. I thought he was missed, especially early on Sunday. The run defense got a little bit better as the game went on. But -hmm. certainly early, to me, his absence was glaring. There is optimism on Dalvin Tomlinson being able to do some stuff in practice this week. So on on Sunday's game, the Cowboys are favored. I saw is, that. I don't what get is it. your what is your theory? I've been trying to so because like if if the game was in Dallas, I totally get that. But the game's here. What's your theory about what Vegas is seeing now? Now Phil's point is that, that from an analytic standpoint, they don't like the Vikings still. But I gotta admit, at what eight and one now, uh, tied with Philadelphia for the best record in the conference and I I know that they lose the tiebreaker but the point is coming off a win against Buffalo I don't care how um how difficult it was I am really surprised that it's not just at least a pick them I'm surprised too now you know in case the audience or some of the audience doesn't know Vegas is trying to get pretty much equal money both sides yep so not only do they want money hammering on the Vikings plus one but they also want people betting Dallas minus one, then they can make their money on the juice, right? So that's what Vegas is hoping for. Equal action, both sides. Mm -hmm. I just don't know how you get equal by making Dallas a road favorite. Now, I understand you can look at Dallas and say of the two teams, they're the more desperate one. That still doesn't add up. Nope. For me, the Vikings coming off that emotional win Sunday. Is there something to be said about the later start? We know how brilliant Cousins is in that noon central window. What about 325? Maybe more eyeballs on Kirk. It still doesn't add up to me, Judd. I don't understand it. I'm surprised as we sit here at 12 11 central time on Tuesday that the line has not shifted. I guess I haven't checked it in the last 90 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Dallas minus one. Judd, I, for the life of me, cannot explain this. It is very weird. Very weird. Um, Wolves, tell me this. All right. So D'Lo gets himself essentially benched on Friday in a loss against the Grizzlies because Chris Finch, at that point in time, apparently can't take it. Uh, He then comes back, D'Lo, that is, on Sunday, and plays his best game of the season against the Cavs in a win. How much do you think, like, like here, here's my assessment, and I didn't watch that, that game because I actually watched the hockey game after the Vikings, and I still had a bunch of uh, Vikings work to do. But here's my assessment. It seems like a very frustrating thing from a Wolves standpoint that D'Lo decides to have his best game or has his best game coming off what's just been a string of subpar performances. I guess the question is this. Do you think what occurred on Sunday changes things, or do you think this remains very much a wait-and-see for what the Wolves get next time they play from their point guard? 
Certainly the latter. I'll go more in depth in a second. One leftover Vikings note, Judd. They do have a tight end coming in today for a visit. Former Green Bay Packer, okay. former Notre Dame fighting Irish tight end, Eliza Mack. I might be botching the pronunciation of the first name, but last name is Mack. I believe okay. it's Eliza. A L I Z E. If I'm botching the pronunciation, that's on me. Last name is Mac. Now I'm told this tryout was lined up on Saturday. So there were some questions about how TJ Hawkinson came out of the game on Sunday, but those things are not tied together. So anyway, yeah. Mac coming in for a tryout today. I've checked on kicker tryouts. I don't have anything, Judd. So as far as I know, Greg Joseph. Is plenty safe. Okay, on D'Angelo Russell, very much a wait and see. Now, I'll go all the way back to media day. Many weeks ago, I had multiple Wolves people. D'Angelo welcomed his first child, his significant other, I guess, did. right. He became a dad right. for the first time just a day or two prior to media day. There was this, like, renewed energy, this, this new vibe. I had multiple people tell me, D'Angelo was in this great space, this great spot. But through the first 10, 11 games, pretty much a train wreck on the court. But, yeah, it changed on Sunday. It's amazing what making some shots can do. He just wasn't making shots. Like, I liked a lot of his looks those first 10, 11 games. He just wasn't making those shots. But definitely a wait and see. Now, I've had a lot of people tell me, Judd, hey, Tim Connolly needs to trade D'Angelo Russell. Judd, there is zero trade buzz right now. That can all change quickly. Typically, trade talk across the league ramps up mid-December. So we're about a month out. Mm -hmm. Undoubtedly, like Connolly wouldn't be doing his job. He's going to make some calls. I've said for a while, I've never had a sense that Tim Connolly has had sincere interest in extending D'Angelo Russell. Now, I don't think he was like always anti D'Angelo. I think he looked at it and said, okay, like we don't need to extend him right now. This is a phenomenal opportunity. He's never played with a big man like Rudy Gobert. Hopefully he's motivated by that. Last time he was in a contract year in Brooklyn, he exploded. Let's see that this year. We have his bird rights. We can then pay him next summer. But like Tim Connolly never had legit interest. I don't sense going back this summer in extending D'Angelo Russell, but definitely a wait and see. Like, I'm yeah. not all in on D'Angelo after one game. Let's see it tomorrow in Orlando. Let's see it against Philadelphia later this week. Let's see it against Miami at Target Center next week. All right, update us on the cat thing, because we, we have talked about cat, you know, if cat continues, or I, I shouldn't say struggles, because it, he's actually put up good box scores. We mm -hmm. have talked about cat's future here several times. But just to be clear, contractually, you can't even consider trading him until after the season if that became a talker, correct? That is correct, which okay. we didn't hit on last Thursday. Yeah. But in apologies for, I guess, me not making that very exact point, but like the Wolves, even if they could, they're not trading Cat during the season. A blockbuster trade like that is an off-season type move. That's not an in-season at the deadline type move. But yes, by rule, even if the Wolves wanted to, they cannot trade Carl Anthony Towns this entire season. So that is accurate. So Carl Anthony Towns will be in a Wolves uniform until minimum next June. All right. L let's uh, turn our attention to the team that on Friday at the Mall of America is going to dominate the day with the day of baseball. They will. Day. And can we get to that in a second? But how about one more Wolves oh, item okay. for you? Yeah, well, a couple. They will Go have ahead. scouting representation, even though, of course, no first-round pick. But in one venue tonight, you've got Trey Holloman, Michigan State, playing Kentucky. Nice. You've got Duke against Kansas, the Champions Classic on ESPN. Two very good college basketball games tonight. So the Wolves will have scouting representation at that game. The Wolves have media availability coming up in three minutes or five minutes. They actually came back to town after Cleveland, then will fly to Orlando later today for the game tomorrow night. I was told last night, I put it on social media, that Nas Reed, who missed three games with an illness, mm -hmm. was expected back at practice today, should make his return tomorrow. One other Wolves note for you, the end of December is fast approaching. 
there's just I've had multiple people, Judd, just say, hey, you might want to dig on just what's going on. Is it a foregone conclusion that Mark Laurie, Alex Rodriguez have the money, that it's a done deal, they'll make this next payment? And so far, I've run into a bit of a roadblock, Judd, but it's something that remains on my radar. From both Those of them? Have been, From both? In, well, I've always been told Mark can come up with the money. Alex is the big concern. Right, I know. But that if need be, instead of 10%, 10%, you know, if Mark needs to go 14%, Alex goes 6%, there are ways to make it work. Like, I've never heard any sort of grave concern about Mark Laurie's ability to come up with the money. But it is interesting how quiet those two have been since the start of the season. Now, they've been present. Like, heck, I saw A-Rod courtside in Memphis. Right. So like they've been around, but it just it seems like the silence is to me, at least something that is noteworthy. So something I'll just I'll continue to keep an eye on as we're about six weeks out from that next payment that Glenn Taylor is due. All right. Now to Friday. Yes. So the twins are going to I believe they're going to have five players there, which indicates there's going to be five versions or there's going to be five combinations of uh, of their new look, their jerseys. Um, one, have you heard what we can expect? And two, fill us in on the more important thing, which is the scoopage on Carlos Correa, what, what the twins are doing. And please tell me it's more than re-signing Kyle Garlick. All right. Well, on number one, no, but that's my own dissatisfaction. I just, I don't care about Jersey. I just don't, I get it. There's a lot of people that Drugi will, Drugi will not, I'm not like, Heisman Trophy putting up my hand to stiff arm. Like if you care about uniforms, jerseys, you got two by kids all means, that will care. That's all you. Enjoy. There's others that can pursue what these uniforms are going to look like. That's just not mm-hmm, my mm-hmm. cup of tea. So I just I don't care. You're right though. Byron Buxton will be there. Yep. If you're a Twins fan, if you're free on Friday, it should be a cool event at Mall of America starting around 11 or 11:30 in the rotunda. Buxton and heck, I don't have the list in front of me. I know Buxton. Joe Ryan's going to be is one of the Joe. guys. Duran, I believe, will be there. Joe Ryan. Ryan with the mustache, great mustache. Yeah, and yeah, two other guys. So you know what you said makes logical sense, but I, I truly I don't know for sure. All right, on Carlos Correa, mm-hmm. Judd, they are going to make him a very nice offer. In fact, I was told this week that they are pushing for closure sooner rather than later now they can push all they want if his representation isn't willing to push back it doesn't matter so it's entirely possible this thing stretches into january yep but i'm told the twins would like closure soon they are going to make the richest offer in team history so right now that is what joe mauer eight years 184 million now to re-sign carlos correa it's going to take a seven, eight, or nine year deal for somewhere in the vicinity of 265 to 300 million dollars, maybe more. So if they merely offer 185 or 190, yes, I guess we note it, but that would be like offering Tory Hunter back in the day what the twins did when the Angels offered 40 million more, right? Like, what's the point in even offering 185 right. or 190? Right. I mean, they need to get to 230, 240, 250. I was also told, Judd, they certainly are open minded to multiple player options. Like, you're going to have to give Correa some hammer in this deal. So, if you get him inked to a seven or eight or even a nine year deal, he'll want like multiple opt out, mm-hmm. you know, opportunities right now. Not after the 23 season, but I wouldn't be shocked if the Twins are willing to offer him an opt-out as soon as even after the 24 season. So in two seasons. But certainly the Twins know they need to get pretty creative. You can't just give him a seven- or eight-year flat contract, right? No trade, all that. Like the Twins are – and they're open-minded to those possibilities. The Twins are not dismissive of what Scott, his his agent, has brought up. They met in Vegas at – at the GM meeting. So he is definitely priority number one, but there needs to be a backup plan, right? Shortstop is the top priority, right? So it's not just career or bust. 
They have reached out on Dansby Swanson. And Xander Bogarts is also represented by Scott, right? So the Twins have brought up his name as well. Now, pecking order-wise, I don't know if they prefer Bogarts or Swanson. My sense would be Bogarts, but that's just a guess. There just isn't Trey Turner steam, at least with Minnesota. There is with the Phillies, some other teams, but right. just not the Twins. But Correa certainly priority number one. But know that they have touched base on Bogarts, on Swanson. On Kyle Garlick, by the way, Judd, that was a take it or leave it. Right? Like, if he says no, they non-tender him with the deadline later this week. So Kyle Garlick had a choice. You either take this deal, which by projections was about $400,000 less than he was expected to get via arbitration, but the mm-hmm. Twins were not willing to pay him a million or 1.1. 1. 1. It was you take this $750,000 or we will non-tender you best of luck on the open market. How about an Emilio Pagan update? Would you like an Emilio Pagan update? Only if you say he's Why he's not? not coming back. Well, guess what? The Twins have tried to work on a multi-year deal with Pagan. So the tender deadline for all these arbitration eligible <laughs> players is later this week. There are oh. easy decisions, right? We know the Twins are tendering Luis Arise. We know the Twins are tendering Tyler Malley. Heck, we know the Twins are tendering Caleb Thielbar, who's heading out of the country on a nice trip later this week. So no, you know, steam on any sort of, you know, one-year compromise or a multi-year deal for Thielbar. But I can tell you on Pagan, the Twins are trying to get him at a very team-friendly deal. It would include a 2024 club option. There isn't any sort of movement on it actually getting done. So if Pagan continues to reject what the Twins are presenting, it's entirely possible later this week the Twins non-tender Emilio Pagan and send him packing. But do know there has been some interest. Just like with Garlic cutting a pre-tender deal, there has been some dialogue about the Twins trying to cut a pre-tender deal with Emilio Pagan. Go ahead, Declan. Amazing. Yeah, I'll let, I'll let Judd sink in that for a little bit more. You know, Dukes, I'll, I'll throw in some reckless speculation here for you. Because this guy seems like a classic ideal guy for the Twins to go after. Uh, Tongue-in-cheek a little bit here, but he was very, very good three, four years ago. And I feel like in the last season, I know he was coming off injury. He would struggled a little bit. I wouldn't be surprised if the Twins bring in a Mike Clevenger in free agency this year. Um, well, I mean, guy Derek who's, Falvey has history with him, yeah. Right. It seems yeah. like that would be that your, yeah, yeah I, I, I feel like that'd be the perfect type of twin signing. And hey, maybe there is something in there, even not me being tongue and cheeky. He was a very good pitcher for Cleveland. Um, I know he battled an arm issue in 2021. He missed all of it. But it, that sounds like an arm to me, just like they've done with Bundy and Chris Archer's in the past, kind of rounding out that rotation. I know they have a lot of internal options that they would like to stick with. But Mike Clevenger to me kind of seems like a classic 1A free agent make good contract with the twins to go after and sign. Well, he's certainly on my radar. I certainly have tried to check. No feedback yet, but he remains on my radar. Just considering the history Falvey has with him from their Cleveland days together, he's actually a fascinating story with multiple Mm -hmm. Tommy John surgeries, right? We think about Chris Paddock, you know, trying to make a comeback at some point in 2023, maybe more like August, not June. But, you know, Chris Paddock, he's another guy that fully expect the Twins to tender him later this week, but... Yeah, it wouldn't shock me, Declan. I just I don't know if there's any real steam on that right now. I can tell you I've checked on some other pitchers, like Chris Bassett. I'd love to see the former Met, Chris Bassett, end up in a Twins uniform. So far, zero dialogue, Twins on Bassett. Jose Quintana, nothing. Now we can debate how good Quintana is, but you could say, okay, the Twins could use a lefty in their rotation, right? So Quintana could fit that bill. Zero chatter twins interest in jose quintana now maybe that changes eventually but as we sit here on november 15th nothing with the twins on bassett nothing with the twins on quintana i did hear the twins made at least an inquiry about the japanese free agent pitcher kodai senga but i would be shocked if he ends up here and there's nothing you know seriously hopping on that front in fact i had somebody close to senga tell me you know, until the Twins resolve the Correa situation and or the shortstop situation, 
like it's just it's hard to envision them, you know, going, you know, big money spending on a pitcher like Senga or even Bassett. Like they want closure on the shortstop position first and foremost. Now they will make a move for a catcher. I mean, Ryan Jeffers right now is the only catcher on the 40 man roster. So we know they will add a catcher, maybe even via trade. That one shocked me. Uh, but like shortstop is is the big one. Like that's that's front and center for them. Now there's other stuff. Like later today, they have some decisions to make on whether to add some guys to the 40 man roster or expose those guys to the rule five draft. Like Matt Canarino, who's going to miss all of next year after Tommy John surgery. But like, would you consider having him rehab? as a 40 man guy, because you really feel like he can help you in 2024. Like to me, I would add Matt Canarino, Julian, who just came off a great run in the Arizona fall league. That's a no brainer. He for sure will be added. The twins right now, 36 players on their 40 man roster. So if they wanted to today, they could add up to four guys. Has the name Corey Kluber come up? (laughs) Not yet, but they've tried. (laughs) I fully expect it. Yeah. They've tried multiple (laughs) times. Yeah. Not yet, but don't be shocked. I mean, you know, this front office, like literally this regime, Judd, not once, but twice has tried to sign Corey. You know what? So it wouldn't shock me. Bayerga at second, Vizquel at short, Tomei at third. Let's just get an all-time Cleveland Guardians Indians thing, okay? I mean, might as well, right? My God. Hey, they won. They've won in the playoffs. Heck, they won in the playoffs in October, right? So I would take yeah. some of that Guardians magic. Yeah, yeah, but I, I want the new, the new guys, not the, not Kluber. Like that's the, that's ten years ago now. Um, go for football. Tanner Morgan has he started his last game at quarterback? Well, yeah, I certainly think so. I mean, I think it's all about Calic Manis right now. Okay. Now I will tell you, like, if Tanner was medically cleared, he'd be taking the podium in an hour. So a few Gophers football players will talk to reporters. Mm-hmm. We'll have a camera there. I won't be there myself, but we'll have a camera there. But three guys will take the podium. It is senior day on Saturday. So I can promise you, Tanner Morgan would have been made available if he was medically cleared, unless they're just trying to hide some stuff. But like he would have spoken at some point this week. Now, he could be added. He could do something tomorrow. I know Brevin Span Ford is doing something tomorrow. We wonder... He still has another year of eligibility. Will he come back in 23? He loves P.J. Fleck. He loves playing for the Gophers, St. Cloud kid. Or will he go pro? I did have an agent tell me who's been in contact that says, if you're like a day three tight end, go back to school. Now, even though Span Ford is up there in age, this is a really good, I was told, tight end draft in April. Okay. That you're better off waiting until the 2024 draft. And just knowing how much Span Ford – Loves the Gophers. I don't know for sure, but, you know, that'll be a question for him tomorrow. Is Saturday your last game in maroon and gold, or will you be back in 2023? On Tyler Newbin, the safety, he too has another year of eligibility. Okay. I fully expect him. In fact, I know a big agency, a big agent that has tried to secure his services that hasn't even been able to track him down. Like, Tyler Newbin is so popular right now. The safety, like, his value is not going to improve. Tyler Newbin needs to go pro, should go pro. The expectation is Tyler Newbin will play his last game for the Gophers, at least at Huntington Bank Stadium, on Saturday. Last thing for you, Gopher men's basketball, which got drubbed by DePaul last night. I watched a big portion, and they looked terrible. When are they going to get enough guys back to look representative? Yeah, I mean, I checked on Jamison Battle's status again this morning. You know, he remains out after that foot surgery. I don't know why they announced in late October it was week to week. I was told always two-ish to three-ish weeks. Okay. Now we're approaching three-ish weeks right now. Could he be back later this week for the game against Central Michigan? That may be a bit aggressive. But, yeah, you look at last night against DePaul, Judd, how badly did they miss Battles shooting? Right now, they didn't rebound real well. They, they didn't make free throws real well. Now that was an issue DePaul in one of the earlier like games. Old school, like that was Ray Meyer kicking though. That was ass kicking. That was bad. Now Pharrell Payne looked good, the true freshman, right? And Ola Joseph, the true freshman, and Henley, the true freshman. They have flashed, yep. right? Braden Carrington made his Gophers debut last night after missing the first couple games. 
with an ankle injury. So more wait and see with the former Park Center star, the former Mr. Basketball. But Ola Joseph, Henley, Payne, there's something there. But man alive. I mean, outside of Dawson Garcia, yep. who do you really trust? Now, Talon Cooper started a lot of games at Moorhead State, but he's never played in a Power 5 conference, right? So there's a long way to go with Cooper, right, and some of these other guys. But like Dawson Garcia, but Garcia needs help. He at least needs his Robin, right? Like Battle and Garcia, because those two kids are so good, they can give the Gophers a fighting chance in many games. But with no Battle, I mean, I'm just telling you, like, the game on Thursday, if Battle can't play, and again, you know, unless, you know, things, you know, dramatically or drastically improve the next 24 to 48 hours, that might be a bit of a long shot. But he's close. Like, Jamison Battle is going to play soon enough. I'm just saying Thursday might be a touch aggressive, although I'll try to have an update for you when we chat on Thursday morning. But, like, you need Battle back. But, yeah, it's looking like it's going to be another long year. You know, hopefully they just don't finish in last place again. Right. The idea is don't be 14th place in the Big Ten again. Right. Can you somehow can you avoid week Wednesday or weakling Wednesday of the Big Ten tournament? Those are the bottom, what, four teams that play on that weakling Wednesday. Can you somehow be above the 11 seed? Yep. But like anybody thinking that this Gophers team can be an NCAA tournament team, finish, you know, top five in the conference, top six. We're not there yet, but recruiting has improved. Just look at the class they signed last week. When you get the number one player out of the state of Illinois with that lineage, Max Christie's younger brother, Cam Christie, when you get a top 25 player in the country, a five-star from the state of California, Dennis Evans, recruiting has gone to another level. So let's give Ben Johnson, his staff, a little bit more time. But like, we shouldn't have big expectations for this year. All right, sir. We'll talk to you Thursday. Thanks, Dukes. Did you see the cool note on Gophers women's basketball? UConn, Paige Beckers, yeah. coming to Williams Arena next November. So any prayer, the percent chance of Paige going pro, the Lynx won the number two pick in the WNBA lottery on yeah. Friday, right? And uh, the Boston girl from South Carolina is – that's a foregone conclusion. Six foot five. She's a superstar. She's going to be the number one pick. So, like, there was a thought for a second, like, what about Paige Becker's going pro? She could go number two to Minnesota. Now, she went on record early in October saying, I'm not going pro. Like, she can make more money, Judge. She can make more money at UConn, right? So, there's no reason to leave UConn. She can make more money at UConn than she can playing in the WNBA, although – would Nike step up with Gatorade, some other big sponsors? But she can make a lot of money staying at UConn, right? And she went on the record in early October before the lottery saying, I'll be back for the 23-24 season. Well, now with a homecoming next year locked in, UConn at the Gophers next November, it's a done deal. Paige Beckers is not going pro after this season. She's out, by the way, for the entire season rehabbing the ACL. Perfect, man. Okay, I will uh, talk to you Thursday. Thanks, okay, Steve. sounds good, boys. All right, See ya. Bye.